What's up, beer geeks? Chris here, the guy behind Beer Scholar. Got a special treat for you today. Dr. Lance Shaner Esquire has flown in all the way from Chicago to San Francisco to participate in an event at Old Devil Moon, my bar here in San Francisco. Um, it's We're pouring 18 different Kvik fermented beers and ciders. Um, and then we're gonna do a panel with myself, Lance, and Damian Fagan from Almanac Beer Company, where we're gonna be talking all about Kvik. And if you don't know what Kvike is, what I'm talking about, watch a few of my previous videos. If uh, you like what you've been seeing, there's tons more great content on the way, so please do subscribe and follow for lots more beer-soaked content in the future. All right, let's get to it. Here's Dr. Lance Shaner and myself having a little chat about all kinds of Kvike goodness and Omega Yeast Labs and so on and so forth. Enjoy. Do my little clap for the lining up of the sound with the video. You know, that's why they do the little clapper thing at the beginning know. of scenes in Hollywood. I didn't know. Because you record sound and video separately. And later you got to light them up, which sense. can be really challenging if yeah. you have no way to figure out where everything goes. I'll be damned. Yeah. All right. We are here at uh, Beer Scholar HQ, a.k.a. the kitchen of my apartment in San Francisco, hanging out with Lance Shaner, who I am extremely stoked, came all the way in from Chicago to hang out with us for our Quiking Raid 2, the Quikening event <laughs> at Old Devil Moon. This is about the most ridiculous name I could... Should have stuck some more quikes in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tried, but that was all I could come up <laughs> yeah. with. Yeah, I think it's going to be a really fun event. Super excited to have you here. I think there's going to be a lot of people there to hear you speak. Damien Fagan from Almanac Beer Company will be there as well. Hopefully we'll have a bunch of very interested folks hanging out, asking us questions. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I haven't participated in anything quite like this Is that uh, right? at this point. I mean, we've made plenty of beers with these yeasts ourselves, but uh, never so many under one roof for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know for sure. As far as I can tell, this is the most quite fermented uh, beers and ciders ever kind of offered under one roof anywhere outside of Norway. But I, I mean, I, I do know. feel like one of the two of us would have known about uh, something yeah. else if there was. Exactly. Um, so for sure, yeah, until uh, September when we have the... Uh, the Quike Fest in Chicago, where it might actually might be similar numbers anyway. I think they're aiming for around 30 oh, is that right? breweries there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I'll have to have like Quikening 3 at Old Devil Moon next beer week and get a bunch of jockey boxes and have like 31. Yeah, it's just an uh, arms race <laughs> for Quike beers. Yeah. It's uh, more and more the case that they're just very much available, though. I mean, obviously more and more breweries are, are seeing this... And, well, before we get into that, let's uh, let's talk about you, Shane Lance. Jesus Christ, I keep wanting to call you Shane Lancer. You know the 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 funny. <laughs> it's funny you say that because this ha I could show you my inbox and my email address, and for some reason there's just something about my name that people think that. Yeah. Um, and I get called Shane weekly in yeah. in emails. It's, uh, it's so like much two so. first names. I have another version of that sweatshirt over there where I had Shane put on it. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's how frequently it That happens. makes me feel a little yes. better. Yes, that, that makes me feel a little better. That is how frequently <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I don't feel terrible. I, I <laughs> yeah, it's just I something even, psychological about it, yeah, I guess. Right? I even caught myself saying it to other people, and I was like, I really need to remember not to do that when I'm actually hanging out with Lance. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I immediately did. So anyway, you are a former attorney... Yes. Which I just learned. And a PhD, right? So, right. Dr. Lance Shaner. Esquire. And Esquire. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. So many initials. Yes. Yeah, too many. You are a yeast scientist who is the co-founder of Omega Labs. Um, you're the guy who, so, so far as I understand, was uh, the person who figured out uh, that Brett Trois was not Brett. Yes. Which is kind of cool. Kind of cool story. Infamous. That, I suppose. Yeah. So maybe just start by telling us about Omega. Sure. Uh, yeah, we were founded in 2013, um, and it's really as a result of a conversation that happened in 2012, end of the year. So while I was an attorney, um, I was talking to a colleague at the firm, Andy Smith, who is starting um, 1090 Brewing in the Chicago area, Chicago okay. suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, he was just talking about where he was going to be getting his yeast from, and it was really around this time I was kind of 
starting to get disillusioned with being an attorney. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind so of law was, were you doing? Uh, intellectual property, patent law, oh, okay. biotech patent yeah, law. There you go. Um, so it was, you know, in my field, I'd kind of trained ultimately to be doing that sort of thing. Right. But getting disillusioned, so I was looking for other avenues still within law so i was looking to maybe do in-house because i was getting that's like the easy the easier path you know well yeah right i mean right uh the the thinking you know you just get really really tired of tracking your hours in you know tenth of an hour increments as a patent prosecution attorney you're working on 15 20 different matters a day little bits at a time right and you find that you've been in the office for nine hours and build six Right. I wanted to just do tasks, yeah. you know. And farm out stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would have been nice. It seems too. like yeah, farm it out to the firms. Yeah. yeah. And oversee that work. And then I had this conversation with Andy. Uh, and it just sparked this idea that we could start a yeast lab in the Midwest. There's nobody else doing it there. Yeah. So I talked to one of my colleagues at the firm, Mark Schwartz, who actually became my business partner. I was just, he, he kind of had has more of an entrepreneurial bent than I did. And a few days later, he came to my office and asked if I wanted a business partner. Yeah, very cool. So I said, yes. So yeah, we, we, this was December 2012. So everything moved pretty, pretty fast. Yeah. Um, so August of that year is when I uh, put in my notice and it felt good. I definitely cool. have not, uh, not regretted it for a moment. I mean, I still, I loved everybody I work with. I still keep in contact with them. Mm-hmm. They're really, really good people. I had a cool crew at my, at my job in New York like that, my law job. But yeah, we were all getting worn down. It, it wears you down. I mean, it, for me, it really was the billable hours thing, you mm-hmm. know, like literally tracking your time in six minute increments. It's, yeah. I think some form of torture. Yeah. For me, it was doing work for, for clients that were kind of scum, like banks, basically. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah I moved, I moved on to beer as well, obviously. And yeah. I don't regret it either. It was yeah. great. And I also did a little moonlighting for a while. I was like, you know, doing the San Francisco Homebrewers Guild, which, I, you know, I launched that. I think I, I did stop before I started writing study guides for the Cicerone exams. But yeah, oh God, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah. The funny thing is I, I've never worked harder than I have when I've you know been in charge of my own fate. In retrospect, I almost feel like naive for having thought I could do it um, just because it was such a monumental task. I think all entrepreneurs feel that way. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're, oh, you always look back and think, well, that was nuts yeah and almost but, if i had known what it was going to take would i have still i mean i you know i yeah. obviously would have but it's like how many employees do you have now oh uh, we're it's, you've grown quite a bit I yeah think. we're around 30 oh, um wow. split between most of them in chicago um at our, all of our production happens in chicago so my business partner is from st louis okay so the bulk in chicago doing production and then um marketing business type people in st louis gotcha well cool let's Tell, tell me real quick about the Brett Twa thing. This is all such a blur. It's all so long ago. This would have been <laughs> was a, it? It was a long time ago. Yeah, it was like 2014, I think. Uh-huh. It was one of the first things I saw online when I, when I you know, yeah. looked you up. Yeah, no, I know. There are, uh, Good Beer Hunting did a story. Oh, that maybe is what it was. Um, and then at the time, Brandon Jones, uh, Embrace the Funk, had done mm-hmm. kind of a, a contemporary write-up of it. Sure. Yeah, it was... I don't know. It all seems kind of silly in uh, retrospect, <laughs> yeah. but it was, I think, probably 2014, pretty early on. And so I didn't, I mean, I'd used Brett in my home, home brewing, but until you know, I started growing yeast for people, uh, I didn't really get to know them intimately, right? Sure. All these strains and all these strains, you know, lot, despite most brewing strains being Saccharomyces cerevisiae, they all have their own personalities. They all grow differently and you kind of get to know them. And so this strain was getting kind of popular at the time, the so-called Bretois. Yep. I used um, it in my home brewing. Yeah. I mean, because it was seemingly this like user-friendly Brett strain that operated, you know, in a kind of normal time frame of SAC. So it was very appealing to people because I think there's a marketing aspect to it too. Oh, definitely. So we started growing this thing enough and, and, and growing other Bretts too that I'm like, this thing is just so different it's behaving so unlike all the other brett's we have mm-hmm. you know, any other brett would take when you do its initial culture it would take three days till you even see a significant amount of growth whereas this one would take off like a normal sack and, and it didn't have so much of the funk factor right yeah it's and then fruity. the other thing about growing brett in a flask uh, on a stir plate is it uh, creates a tremendous amount of acetic acid ethyl acetate so mm. the culture at the end ends up smelling like you know nail polish or vinegar mm. and feet and this smelled fruity and didn't have any of that 
crazy fungus and was not making acetic acid. Yeah. Um, so all of these things just started piling up. And I'd reached out to a colleague who's now a uh, professor at uh, Cornell University uh, who I'd gone to graduate school with and sent him the strain because he's, uh, you know, fairly frequently sequencing. And so he did that and it came back as uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I'm like, well, that's odd. Maybe, maybe I contaminated something, you know, mm-hmm. something with a brewing strain. So, you know, my first instinct was to not believe the results we had right. in front of us. And then what happened is on, on Milk the Funk, somebody had asked, you know, what the strain was in, in one of these blends of ours. So I said, well, it's this strain, but, you know, it's actually not a bread. Like right. We had it sequenced and it's a cerevisiae. And this just caused a pretty big uproar. Yeah. So there ended up being a lot of back and forth <laughs> on Milk the Funk. It was like a several day controversy. Sure. Those guys don't mess around. Man. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and, but again, you know, there are a lot of scientists on there too. Right. So people started doing verification uh, of this, you know, and, and I, I mean, I, had, I saw on like Reddit and other things, people were saying, oh, he's just a troll. <laughs> I mean, we weren't very well. Again, we were very small at the time. So, yeah, some people on Reddit were saying I was just a troll or something. Like I was trolling White Labs or something. And I'm like, Oh, that's uh, funny. I'm like, like, this isn't anybody out there can get this done for, you know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks. This is not <laughs> this is not cutting edge science. It's funny that no one had ever out. bothered. Yeah. And again, with with the weird unbrett like characteristics it had. Yeah. So I don't know why it took so long to, yeah. for somebody to just kind of like look behind the curtain. Yeah, we did and put that out there. And that was I feel that, like I that uh, brought you some small like renown. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it helped to show that we weren't idiots, you know, like, you know, we knew. Yeah, we know what we're doing right. and and we're willing to punch up maybe too. You right. know, I don't know. Right. Um, yeah, because you were. Entering a market dominated largely by just a couple other pretty big yeast lab, you know, companies, mm-hmm. suppliers. I imagine you had to, uh, yeah, work kind of hard to get your name out there at yeah. first, I suspect. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like we've been around long enough at this point yeah. that it's People gotten, do. yeah, it's gotten sure. easier and our, our reputation's good, but definitely for a long time, I felt like we had to fight harder to convince people that we were, you know, making good yeast sure uh, and they just would assume that these other established ones were superior and the funny thing is i'd been looking in without naming names like Uh looking at cultures from other people from established players Mm -hmm. and finding things that were not supposed to be there oh interesting um regularly um to the point that in some perverse way it almost gave me more confidence Confidence, (laughs) in what we were doing i'm like you know we're testing our stuff and it's coming out clean and and we're doing you know yeah. All the QC we can to make sure we're putting out good stuff. And but on the other hand, it was always then frustrating when you know people would be hesitant to switch to us. When you first open, I imagine you're trying to sell like the most popular strains, but now you're so far as I know, you're kind of like really dipping your toes into the, the quike stuff and oh yeah. Uh, you seem like you're really on top of the game there. I mean, we've been at it for a long time. And yeah. this is, yeah. I, I think I was just looking back in our records, it was 2015, I think, when we oh, first really? started having, when we first. I read, you know, Lars' blog. Right. And so we reached out to Lars at the time. He didn't get back to us. For yeah. I think he just thought we were some, yeah. you know, crackpot. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> uh, he's a busy guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he has a real job and a family. Too, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, but I'd been following the stuff enough to know that he had deposited these strains with the NCYC. So he had been, you know, putting all these cultures in there. So uh, reached out to them. And just kind of reading the descriptions from Lars' blog, we ended up landing on stranda strain that just sounded kind of neat and the one that we wanted to try right so again this is 2015 uh and got that strain from ncyc and and first thing we did put it to a test to put it the split batch right so you know 68 70 degrees 85 and in the 90s would that have been like a blend of things that one was was one of the ones that they only got a single strain oh interesting so stranda and it was like one cell Oh. The one colony of whatever was brought to NCYC was all they get. So this one hmm. barely hung on. Wild. So the, the beer yeah. came out really, really good. Um, really couldn't tell the difference between the three conditions, hmm. uh, other than the highest temperature one uh, attenuated slightly more. Okay. Um, but other than that, they weren't hugely different. Uh, but we were believers from that first beer. Because, again, we you know if you'd done an English ale in the 90s, it would be fused. A mess. And, and 
ester and hard to drink. Yeah. But these were all really, really good. So really right off the bat, we're like, these are these things are awesome. There's something to this, yeah. yeah. So, and that's the one you call hothead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we call that hothead because at the time, again, we're talking 2015. Yeah. Nobody knew what these things were. Right. What our first thought for a name was going to be Norwegian Farmhouse Ale. Right. And right. we quickly abandoned that because I'm like, if we do this. There's a whole bunch of others. Yeah, right. And uh, not only that, but people associate the word farmhouse with, with Belgian. Yeah. Belgian saison. Yeah, yeah, with the phenolic uh, characteristic. Yep. We knew that we would be constantly fighting, and we still fight it to some degree. Oh, totally. Just people because, ask. Yeah, because just because people know their farmhouse, yeah. uh, they're very literally farmhouse ale strains, and they're that they came from. Yes. Yeah. And that they actually they're more so than that's a, saison. Exactly. They're they're more farmhouse than Dupont. Right. So you know we were going to be fighting that battle. So we're like, okay, we can't call it farmhouse ale. Right. So we ended up just landing on Hothead, just this kind of yeah. this cute name that yeah, yeah. is partially descriptive of what it was. We've since, as we've added more strains, we've kept the Quake name because now people look for this sort of thing, and we get found by Google searches for Quake. But at the time, had we come out with a strain called Stranda Quake, yeah, no one would have known. No, I mean, uh, so to really by naming it Hothead, we kind of just. It was, just a, it was a marketing thing to yeah. try to get yeah, more people oh, to try it, course. right? But, you know, again, the name has taken on enough now that we can call them Quake because people are looking for them right. and interested in where they came from. And since then, you have released two others. Right. Um, so we have the Voss Quake, which is the second one that we released in the Hornendal. Voss, we did get directly from Lars. Mm-hmm. Um, we just isolated one of the, the strains out of that. Yeah. And... Uh, Hornendal, though, we maintained the yeast blend. Yeah, I don't know how many strains there are in there, but it's is that right? many. Oh. So when you sell when you sell a batch to a pro brewery, it is actually a blend. Yep, the Hornendal. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. Um, I didn't no know bacteria. I assumed it was a uh, single strain. Not for that oh, one. Oh, it's very cool. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, so there had been enough uh, kind of academic work done on these things that by this point that some of the Hornendal strains had different features in them, different alcohol tolerances, different flocculation, and mm-hmm. we didn't really want to go through the, you know, picking one out and picking the wrong one, you know? Right. So we're like, well, what's wrong with just going with the blend? Sure. Um, yeah. So just kept got, it. Got a little bag of some... From Hornendal. I have brewed with that a few times. I think it does have bacteria in it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, frankly, it's remarkable that, that some of these didn't. I mean, when they've uh, examined some of these, some of them don't have bacteria in Right. There. And these people do not have labs. What do you think? I mean, my guess is they're fermenting so fast and furiously and so hot that, that just any bacteria that got in there is just out-competed. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. Uh, I, I mean, for a long time, I thought that was... Primary uh, factor, um, yeah, because alcohol content gets high quickly. Yeah. Um, that inhibits yeast. Presumably, they're using hops. That's going to, or bacteria. bacteria yeah. uh, presumably, the hops are going to inhibit bacteria to some degree. And then uh, I was talking to a, home, a group of home brewers in Milwaukee. One of them pointed out that there was something in the New York Times several years ago talking about bacteria in cutting boards mm. and how uh, plastic cutting boards are far more prone to having bacteria all over them and being hard to get rid of than wooden cutting boards. Okay. So there are, I think, some natural antimicrobials in wood. And as we know, this is how these uh, cultures are stored, is right. on wood. Right. So I think part of it is also the de- desiccation on wood and whatever uh, antimicrobials the wood is putting out that helps keep these cultures pure. I think it's a sound theory. I think all these things probably right. come together. Between the Stronda, Voss, and Hornendal strains, maybe tell us like briefly what the profiles seem like to you. I mean, I'm sure depending on temperatures and other ingredients, you're always going to end up with some different stuff Yeah. in the final beer. And we have tried to do more kind of very, almost like a Blondale type recipe to try mm-hmm. to get a handle on right. what the actual strains uh, themselves are like. So, And that's what we did with uh, hothead Stronda when we first got it. Mm-hmm. We always get from uh, Stronda a almost like honey and mango, like mild mango notes out okay. of those. But otherwise, I'd say the most neutral of the three that we have. Voss does have kind of a little orangey, a little citrusy thing going on. Mm-hmm. Hornendal, we get almost like a dried fruit, a little bit of pineapple, um, but the fruitiest of the three, for sure. Okay, Hornendal. Um, yeah. yeah, and almost uh, some people in the lab describe it as almost like an umami uh, hmm. type note to it. I okay. don't know. You know, everybody perceives things differently. I don't know yeah. if I get that, but I do think it's the most characterful of the three that we've got. 
It seems like it's been the most popular pick when I've done collabs with breweries, yeah. but it might be because I, I mean, I do perceive it as the most, uh, you know, characterful. Uh, yeah, highest alcohol tolerance, so that's fun to be. It's very, very fast fermenting. So works think, great for IPAs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, works in IPAs. That one definitely works great for hazy IPAs. Do the others? Yeah, there are, we have customers that uh, use Voss. Uh, I don't okay. know if Hothead would. It seems to drop pretty clear, mm -hmm. um, but Voss works in hazies. There gotcha. are customers that use Voss as their house strain, gotcha. and they're doing hazy IPAs. When I just did uh, a double IPA with Almanac uh, collab using your Voss, and that was only seven or eight days ago that we brewed it. It is now in kegs at my bar, so we'll get to try that later today. Um, my understanding is it's hazy, so yeah, yeah, that'll be the first hazy I've had with Voss, though. Oh yeah, no, I think it, it works well. You came out with Hothead in 2015. It is, you know, now four years later, and breweries are just kind of starting to catch on. It's it's starting to you know do that trending thing, kvai strains and and beers made with them. To me, it feels like a lot of breweries are going to first think of this as like, oh, you know, maybe this is the latest goofy trend or. Or just like, we're going to make a few of these and then label them as mm -hmm. Fike and then move on. Um, but from where I'm sitting, it just looks like it could be actually a game-changing you know, ingredient for the, you know, could change the economics of the whole industry. So I'm interested in what your impression is. You've been working with it, thinking about it a lot longer than most yeah. people. So. There's probably some of both sides. Some brewers maybe are never going to come around to this as being just kind of a general tool. Yeah. Um, but there's absolutely some of that. And there's a small brewery that was uh, very confined in space. Uh, they mm -hmm. had uh, kind of a basement brewery and literally could not put any more fermenters in there. So, right. uh, so his primary purpose in using, and he uses Voss as his house strain, his primary purpose is to be able to get more out of his system. Increased capacity, yeah. Yeah, and he even, I don't think he's pushing it to the degree he can. I think he said before, whatever strain he was using before, probably some sort of Chico or something like that, he is, you know, double dry hop IPA would have had like a 14-day turnaround, something sure. like that. But now he's, uh, I think he aims for 12. Okay. Which isn't a, I mean, that it, it makes a big difference when Com you spread that over huge. a year, right? Yeah. Um, but that's the thing. I think he could be going even faster than that, right? right. I mean, it is, we've done several beers uh, as collaborations where the goal was to put it out in a week. Right. Um, and, and you're not sacrificing quality when you do this. This is just how these work. Absolutely. So, yeah, if, you're, if your bottleneck is equipment, these can make a huge, huge difference yeah. um, without sacrificing quality. I feel like, uh, yeah, like all these, all these like kind of smaller breweries that get hype, you know, they're like kind of instantly at, you know, at capacity. And then um, all you can do is expand. At least that's what most people thought a yeah. couple years ago. Now it's like, well, maybe you can boost your production without even really doing much besides changing your yeast, your main yeah. yeast strain that you use. I mean, just because all the yeasts we have used uh, up until now take a week to ferment, that doesn't mean that that's how it has to be. If right. There aren't other strains that can go faster. And, right, right. Um, so I, yeah, maybe. When you don't have to push it to the, to the absolute limit either, right? Like a... If, if a brewery can increase their production by 20%, that could be enormous for the bottom line. Yeah, and it can bridge the gap in, in that wait for additional equipment. Or What happens uh, when some, you know, a monster like Goose Island starts using it, playing it out all the way? Does that mean, uh, you know, the Goose Islands of the world can, like, flood the market with, like, s cheaper craft beer? Or I just, I don't know. I, you know, I need, I, I would love to, like, sit down with, yeah. it's like, a, uh, someone who, it's like an economist who studies the beer industry or something. Yeah, yeah, somebody better than at math than me. Yeah, I have to look at those things. Word is kind of getting out about it. I mean, I imagine you're seeing more more orders for these for these strains. I'm curious. Do you feel like everyone's just kind of testing it out now? I'd still say it's in the testing phase. I yeah. mean, we we definitely a good number of customers have said, "Wow, you know, we're we're convinced we're you know, putting this into our kind of normal uh, workflow," mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, but we're still, I'd say, in the test phase, so we'll For have sure. to see how uh, things pan out. But they definitely, they make up a good portion of our output. Yeah. So I think, yeah, there's growth. You know, if you're an established brewery and you have a certain flavor profile that people are used to, yeah. you're not going to just, immediately, you know, overnight suddenly change the way all your beer does. Right. Breweries like Goose Island, the really big ones, I think, are actually, in a lot of ways, slower to take up these sorts of oh. things. Um, yes. Just because they are, They're because they have much these, slower to pivot than right. just about every just, way. They have yeah. these very established brands. 
I mean, how long did it take till um, Boston Beer had a hazy IPA? They eventually did. They do it late, and it just, it's like, what, is this what the kids are doing these days? Right. Oh, uh, absolutely. So maybe they'll come around to it someday, but I think those are the breweries that are going to be slower to take up these sorts of things. That's interesting, because they have the most to gain in terms of capturing, like, efficiencies from, from a quicker quicker turnaround. But yeah. again... You know, it kind of doesn't matter that much, maybe, unless you actually need to be cranking out more beer faster. Yeah. The larger you are these days, the more you're struggling. Absolutely. Because um, yeah. you're starting to get your heels nipped at right. by lots and lots of yeah. uh, little new. guys. You're not and new and shiny anymore. You're not no. pushing the boundaries. You're uh, dying a death of a thousand cuts right, uh, right. these days. When you've got actual shareholders telling you, uh, oh, let's not try that experiment. That yeah. one sounds expensive. Yeah, I'm excited to see what what change is sort of wrought on the industry by this over the years. I think that you know, my my gut feeling is that more and more breweries will adopt these strains as mm-hmm. house strains. You know, I think about people who are who are starting a new brewery. And think, hey, we don't need as much equipment as we thought we did, so maybe our startup costs are less. And mm-hmm. I think about breweries in you know Florida or or other hot places like, oh, hey, we don't have to knock out our wort after the boil all the way down to, you know, 60 something degrees Fahrenheit. Now we can just leave it at 90. Mm -hmm. And then we also don't have to chill our fermenters very much. And so we're saving a fortune on energy and and water usage. Yeah, just power usage too, though, Mm -hmm. you know, for for chilling rows and rows and rows of fermenters. You know, if you're keeping them all in the 60s, that takes a lot of energy. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we'll see, keep seeing this play out. I don't think we're all the way there in the evolution yet, yeah. where these things are going. I've made the prediction that uh, that I think most breweries will be using this, um, or a lot will be switching to it over the years. I mean, I know that it will be there will be a slow change, but I, I feel like it is this like kind of slow moving tidal wave. Yeah, you know, and really, I'm mean, pro- to the point where someday people won't be talking about these as a novelty, right? It'll totally, just be you're a, not going to put that on the branding right. or on the label of the beer yeah. because it'll just be like it'll be like Chico or something. Who yeah. cares? You know, no big um, deal. I mean, I think there's a lot of craft beer is having a story behind what you're doing, and this is currently part of the story. But you know, at some point, the consumer's not going to care. They'll have seen yeah. it. And it's just the house strain. What about uh, you know, Lars? Lars has traveled around um, other. Parts of Europe as well, finding all these interesting, mm-hmm. um, like land race yeasts. Do any of the other ones sound interesting to you? Are you aware of the like? You know, I think there's there's some Lithuanian right. stuff. And no, we we have a Lithuanian one. Oh, so, is it yeah. available? Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. um, so Yovru uh, Farm has uh, that. So Lars has written about that one too, mm-hmm. and that that has I think kind of a fun story behind it. So uh, the Lithuanian consulate in Philadelphia reached out to us, oh, cool. which doesn't happen every yeah. day when you're, uh, you know, own a yeast lab. <laughs> yeah. So they're reaching out to us on behalf of Aldona Udrian, who's the brewer of uh, Yovaru, um farmhouse ale. She had, the, the story goes that her great grandfather had found the strain in the kind of local woods there. So they've been brewing with the strain, you know, since the 1800s okay repitching serially since the 1800s and they um, actually had an origin story for it though. yes that's, that's mm-hmm. unusual i think yeah so this one it is a phenolic strain it is diastatic so mm-hmm. it's it's very different than the kvike strains right but it it also has kind of a unique flavor profile we almost get like the lemon pith out of it black pepper instead of mm-hmm. a clovey flavor interesting um so it is nice um and we ended up coming to a a, a deal with them so that we can market the strain using her you know, her name the Yovaru name in the strain okay um, and she gets uh, essentially royalties from the sales so we're, we're supporting um, her as well because cool. the story is that her her kids don't want to you know, carry on the brewery so this you know once she's done with it who knows what's going to happen with it and was she running it as or continues to run it I don't know as a as a like a a commercial brewery yeah. Or? Yeah, oh, okay. They, they uh, package beer in plastic bottles, so oh, that's uh, we okay. we got the yeah the strain in a bottle, a plastic bottle of uh, cool. beers. How we harvested it. I've seen photos of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it had a so we actually when we got it, we sent it off to to be sequenced just to check, mm-hmm. and I don't want any one of these controversies biting us right <laughs> the years down. And uh, interestingly, it came back as a, an unknown Saccharomyces. Okay. We sent this to Charles River, who has you know thousands and thousands of yeast cultures in their collection, so you think they have everything. Mm-hmm. So for it to come back as an unknown species, it's like, well, that's mm-hmm. remarkable. Um, 
given that it is diastatic, so it's got the style one gene, I think what we're going to find, and we're working on this, is that it's a hybrid. You see a lot of hybrid yeasts in the brewing world. Mm -hmm. um, lager yeast is the best known example. It's probably a servicier and something else hybrid, but we're doing full genome sequence on, sequencing on it to figure out exactly what it is, where it fits into the brewing world. It's neat that, you know, Lars is going around and kind of examining these cultures that we really don't hear anything about otherwise. I feel like he's just doing the entire community this enormous service. It's one of those things that started out as just some fun thing he was doing because he thought it would be neat. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden it's like, wow, you are saving possibly, you know, this big chunk of brewing history yeah. and bringing it to light. It only takes a generation or two of people to sort of just stop doing it like mm -hmm. Like with the family you were just talking about, for these things to be lost. I go around and talk about these things a lot, and that's kind of one of the things I've thought about. Looking back at how Lars found these things and the, the Lithuanian strain, if you were to go back to the 1800s when we first uh, kind of isolated yeast and figured out how to do pure cultures, mm -hmm. just imagine how many cultures were jettisoned at that oh, time. Oh, yeah. Right? The vast majority, yeah. presumably. So, you know, I mean, 150 years ago, we probably had huge huge biodiversity right. that once we isolated a pure strain and people are like wow i can make good consistent beer now mm -hmm. screw this culture i've got that you know sometimes works but right. sometimes doesn't right i'll just get rid of it um we lost there was a like i tell people it's a yeast genocide sometime in the 1800s yeah once we had a pure pure cultures of yeast and never thought about that yeah and but which i which makes me feel even better that lars is kind of shedding light on these things and we're getting them stored away in places like the NCYC where they're, they're now safe. Yeah. You know, uh, they will have these things forever now. Right. Whereas all these other cultures from the 1800s, I mean, who knows what we lost? I mean, just, that is an interesting, yeah. Wow. I never thought about that. And when I first read, um, Lars's blog, when I ran across it back, back whenever the quite thing sounded very interesting to me, but what really, it wasn't what jumped out at me as, as um, just immediately exciting. What was more exciting is, as a home brewer, I just thought, oh my God, these people are kind of doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm doing this in my backyard. And what they're doing is so similar. And I was already kind of into the concept of farmhouse beer and brewing because of this sort of idea I had about it um, based on what I had heard about like the Belgian version of it and the Belgian countryside. And that sounded really neat, but it was um, kind of uh, this like pretty idea. Like it's, it's not really happening anymore. Mm -hmm. um, whereas here it was just like real life. It's just like living history. And Lars is really kind of just capturing that and uh, bringing it to the world. So that's yeah. a huge service. Another thing that shocks me in, in our modern craft beer environment, where every brewery is like looking for the next big thing that'll make them different, give them a leg up, uh, bring them some attention. How did this not become a huge trend already? Yeah, that just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, so maybe maybe it would have you know maybe somebody would have stumbled across at some point, but I'd... Michael Jackson did mention it that there was this special yeast strain. I think he he was talking about some people he met in Voss who had their own special yeast strain. So it's, it wasn't unknown. That would have been in the 90s, I think. So it wasn't completely unknown to the beer world, you know. It got a mention. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't... It'd be interesting to go back and look at that because, I mean, did he talk anything about these, like, crazy characteristics or how they were brewing? Like, that. Yeah. that's, I think, what really kind of captured people. You know, just how different it is right. from how, you know, the English... Brewing. I've seen the passage, and, and it, it's really sort of... He just, like, breezes by, like, oh, yeah, you know... They have their own strain. It's yeah. sort of, he just sort of zips by it. But, you know, he's covering the whole beer world in a way that uh, was a little bit less focused than what Lars is doing. So right. I'm excited about it. It's like maybe the most important thing I think that's happening in beer right now in terms of keeping an eye on where we come from and why we care. The craft beer scene is super exciting, but I think everyone got into it because they were probably, a lot of us were homebrewers. And this just feels very connected. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is the, it, it all springs from literal homebrewers. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. And, uh, those farmhouse these brews are not commercial breweries. Only recently have commercial breweries actually been pushing style boundaries, maybe a little more than homebrewers. 
you know, homebrewers, I mean, I think all the major exciting stuff used to come up yeah, from, from the homebrew it world, out. and now I think maybe it's a little more even. But that's because a lot of those guys who are pro brewers were, you know, are of yeah. the mindset of homebrewers because that's the world they come from. So. Right, yeah, to the point where almost the, the homebrew world seems like it's kind of dying a little bit. You know, I, I don't want to agree with you, but I think... Well, maybe dying is not the... Yeah, yeah, I think it had a big trendy moment. Well, you know, a long trendy moment. And I, I as the co-founder of the San Francisco Homebrewers Guild, I obviously still know tons and tons of people who are into it. Here in San Francisco, it's actually hard, like kind of challenging to be a homebrewer because we all have little apartments mm. and yeah, it can be a little frustrating. But it does seem like maybe like a little excitement has dipped slightly. Yeah, the, the theory I've heard, and I feel like it's a sound one, is that it's the growth of craft that's actually causing the downfall homebrewing like it's it's back in the day uh, it's it would have been hard to get certain styles of beer uh, mm-hmm. so oh, you're true. like oh i'm gonna make this you yeah. know i can't buy this because it's only available you know a right. thousand miles away from me so i'll make it but now when you can go down the street and have like a choice of three or four breweries doing kind of neat you know unusual sure. things it just kind of like saps your uh, <laughs> your desire to do it yeah. yourself because it's so easy to have this you know, wide swath of beer yeah at hand that's a good point yeah i can see that i certainly always had the attitude as a home brewer and which was a different one than a lot of people had that i just wanted to make weird things that i couldn't buy um certainly other people are like you know making you know the same style over and over and over dialing it in oh yeah you know more of the engineer mindset uh that was those guys of course tended to be the best brewers yeah but i uh i like to just do weird experiments all the time and I just like to break things apart and know how they work to some degree. I mean, I wasn't to that degree where I was like fiddling with, um, you know, the, just changing one little malt each time. I right. didn't have that level of attention, but um, definitely, I think what initially got me into it is just wanting to know how things work. Like, oh, there's oh, beer. Yeah. How do you make beer? Like, what I think really grabbed me was not only is the science of brewing extremely interesting, but you know, if you do give Ten brewers the same exact recipe and the same exact ingredients you're going to get 10 pretty different beers generally you know it feels like there's some kind of art at, in, as in addition to the yeah the science i side. think that's uh, just a uh, i think that's a reflection on how all i mean even down to water how much of a difference the water you're using makes in the the beer profile this is reminding me of a conversation i had with somebody from good beer hunting or something <laughs> talking about you know how strains are named and how they're alluding to a certain brewery and like isn't that kind of like taking that brewery's thing. I'm like, it, you can have yeah, the ingre- no. every, all the ingredients for Hetty Topper. Yep. Brew it. It's not going to taste like exactly like Hetty Topper. 100%. Right? I mean, because your equipment plays a role in what the beer is going to taste like, your water plays a role. Yep. All of these things play a role in what the beer is going to turn out to be. <laughs> yeah, I always thought the clone, the cl- you know, books full of clone recipes and stuff were kind of uh, strange. Uh, like, that was a strange concept because of, what you were just talking about before, which is why would I make that beer when I can just go buy it? It's almost just like an exercise in uh, seeing how great of a brewer you are, maybe. Yeah. And dial it in so you can't even tell the difference. That's yeah. this in a pro beer. And, and frankly, anyone who can make a beer that fools the drinker into thinking it might be a pro beer, that's, uh, you know, that's a great home brewer. Yeah. Also reminding me of when, re- you know, reading Lars's, Lars's descriptions of these yeast strains, I'm like, read them, I'm like, wow, that one sounds really good. I got to be we brewed with it. I'm like, Mm-hmm. We didn't really get that at all. <laughs> like, uh, and then it just got me thinking more about that thing. It's like, you can't, the brewer has his own ingredients that are all, in, and his own water and his own hops and his equipment, yeah. all these things that are coming together to give the beer that taste. Right. That unless you're doing a controlled experiment where you have the same wort and you're splitting it with three different yeasts, right. how can you Which say? Which is fun. Yes, like, and that, that's yeah. how I love, that's how yeah. we brew at the lab all the time. Yeah. Um, but unless you're doing that, you can't say, what the yeast is, what flavors the yeast is bringing to that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've found some of the descriptions that when we have done these sorts of experiments, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the descriptors we have, we try to get from yeah, doing a very basic work and splitting it, always including a strain we know well mm-hmm. as kind of like the, the baseline strain yeah. and saying how does it differ from that. Yeah, um, kind of almost like a control or something. Yeah. Well, I am uh, excited to have you come over to Old Devil Moon and and maybe talk about some of these same exact things. I don't know. Yeah. To uh, the public, let's let's close out with a couple questions. Um, what are you drinking these days? 
loggers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> typical, yes. the typical uh, uh, in the business the answer. Evolution of a craft drinker. Getting back to like just the, the cleanness of it, you know, and yeah. tasting, tasting every component of it without getting overwhelmed by one component, you know, like by just hops. I do still love the hazies myself. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, a good summery one that's a little bit on the lighter side. I love, I love like the hazy pale ales. I like it if it'll if I'm if I want to go back for another one. That's right. how I'll uh, oh, say it's yeah. a good one. But some of them are just too sweet to want to have a second one. Oh my god, I totally agree. Like I would say maybe even the majority of hazy IPAs. I'm just like, why don't we just call it a hazy blonde or something like the There's what is IPA about this other than the fact that it has a bunch of hops in it? Because it's it's really balanced evenly. Maybe even in some cases to the sweeter. And and then the milkshake IPA even takes it further, right? Where you're, they're just not bitter at all. Yeah. Which, I, I mean, IPA is popular, so you got to slap that label yeah. on there. But it's these, I feel like the minimum requirement for calling something an IPA should be that it is at least balanced, somewhat bitter. And I don't know how I've managed this since so many people are making them, but I don't think I've even had a milkshake IPA. Yeah, well... <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a personal uh, thing. I don't love them for the most part. I've had a few good ones, but anyway, if, yeah, you know, I would say you're not missing much. So. But you know, yeah. try one, try one. Sometime. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't <laughs> know why or how I haven't, but, and I'm sure I will someday. Yeah. Yeah. Real creamy. Yeah, you know, just a rich, richer mouth feel. Like yeah, that. and I, I think it goes back to. I mean, I like to drink things that I want to have a second of, and that doesn't strike yeah. me as something I'm gonna. I mean, it's right. something I'd probably like in a you know like a shot glass this size is, to taste is, it. But this is why uh, we do four ounce, ten ounce, and pint sizes at Old Devil Moon because we've got you know twenty handles, and maybe I feel like half of them at any given time are things that yeah no, you're not gonna go back for a second one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't mean they're bad. Right. It's just, oh no, no, it's not something you they're want fun and, and exciting. Yeah, yeah. Tell me something, if you can, without revealing a secret. Uh, what's, like, coming uh, from from Omega? Um, what are you so, excited about? Yeah. So what I'm excited about is starting at the beginning of this year, um, we have a full-fledged R&D program. I mean, it's something we'd, especially early on, I mean, I'd call the twa, twa gate mm. uh, part of uh, kind of our R&D, you know, kind yeah. of answering questions. We'd, we did some things with lacto early on. There was this thought that lacto could... could Fully attenuate wort, and oh. you know, I, because of certain blog entries out there, and I've never, I, I've never heard that. It used to be a thing, believe it or not. Huh. Um, but you know, we we knew this wasn't possible, so we <laughs> did uh, just a very simple experiment to show that it couldn't be done, and put those results out there, and that got you know some cool. attention on yeah. uh, Milk the Funk. So we loved doing those sorts of things, but just as the company grew, it got to be harder and harder to put time and research. Like I spent all sure. my they answering emails and phone calls, uh, you know, yes, so yes, I can't no. do any of that the stuff. The fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to find time for that. Yeah. So Especially when you're a family man. Yeah. So it's, it was just got harder and harder to put the effort into those sorts of things. So in January, we hired Laura Burns, who is actually the head brewer at Great Central Brewing, which is a big uh, contract brewer in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, so she has a PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics. So she's now in charge, I mean, full-fledged, all R&D, making, like, mating new strains, yeah. creating new strains, looking for new assays to um, detect, you know, diastatic, okay. like, new tools yeah. for brewers. We're, we're to the point now where we can dedicate resources into R&D. So I'm thrilled for the sorts of things that she's going to This actually reminds me of, of something um, I saw your partner mention in a video where he was speaking to a homebrew club. I think he was talking about a... Yeast strain that you guys had developed based on the DuPont Saison strain, but which doesn't stall out all the time? Yeah. Yeah, so this was the, f- the first in our, our hybrid series. So it is a hybrid of the French Saison and DuPont Saison that we uh, cutely call Saisonstein's monster. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, the, and the whole goal going into it was to have something that attenuates as reliably as the French, right. but tastes more like the Saison strain. So yeah. some of these strains will go through a sexual cycle. It's just a matter of finding which ones mm-hmm. will, and then fermenting through those strains so you find one that's got kind of features you yeah. want. Yeah. Um, so that's what that one is. It's more like Cezanne or the DuPont, but cool. works like the French. There are, I'm sure you're aware, companies that are, are doing interesting things. One, one of them's out here in the Bay where they are kind of 
manipulating the genetic makeup of yeast so that when they ferment, they will add, you know, the hops. flavors of hops in mm -hmm. particular is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to use as many hops, bring down the cost of making hop forward beers. Are you guys doing any playing with any stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, not? we have, we have the tools <laughs> um, yeah, okay. to play with that sort yeah. of thing. Um, I feel like, yeah, that's like sensitive because some people are going to be like, Oh, you're real Frankenstein stuff going yeah, on. Yeah. Um, that is, I think that's a, an interesting uh, direction. For yeah. Me. And I, I, I do think it's where things are going. Yeah. Um, it's going to happen. There either are probably freezers full of things out there, you know, waiting to see the light of day, waiting till the public is accepting of it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I, I was just at the, our local MBAA chapter talking about, you know, the future of yeast and talked about those sorts of things. And somebody after I was, I was done talking, asked the crowd, you know, if, as a brewer, would you produce and serve a beer made from a genetically modified yeast? Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of the room raised their hands. Yeah. Yeah, we'd do it. Yeah. I think the uh, the funny, and the wine side of that, right. like, there are, like, active like, groups like out there fighting that sort of thing. Yeah. But the beer world, I don't know. I think that's part of the ethos of the beer world, that yeah, they're I, a little more adventurous. We are 100% excited about what, new ingredients and technologies can we incorporate i don't think genetic modification steps over the line i imagine there's something that might but with wine and their their whole marketing shtick of the terroir focus uh it sounds like something that they wouldn't be into yeah the w wine's hard to figure out because there are the, um, they'll load up their wines with sulfites right, right. <laughs> yeah. there are certain things they have no qualms about that's traditional Dump, yeah i guess <laughs> this like a, it's a traditional chemical yeah 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 uh they're, they're i can't figure out wine because some things they seem very like they're they don't have any problem dumping certain chemicals in there sautern is uh you know rotten grapes right mm -hmm. like i mean they're they're I don't know. I, like I said, I haven't figured them out yet. There's going to be like a struggle to the to the end of time between beer and wine. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there are certain aspects of genetically modifying things that people aren't going to have. If, if, if one can explain to them yeah. what's behind behind it, they right. won't have as much problem. Like what yeah. the Verstreppen lab, for example, did uh, released a paper where they uh, introduced the same mutation that creates the POF minus yeast. So mm -hmm. the, kind of the natural state of yeast. POF minus. Plus, that's right? like, I always call it POF, but that's oh, fun, yeah, fun no. to hear you say POF. Yeah. Do most scientists say POF? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I Go, ahead. Go ahead. Go uh, <laughs> ahead. So the natural state is to be uh, POF plus. So they have a, a gene called FDC1 that uh, it's really Frulic acid decarboxylase. So mm -hmm. it just takes frulic acid, which is present in malt, right. decarboxylates it. That turns into 4-VG, which is what we taste as yep. clove. Um, so an American ale yeast, an English ale yeast, has a mutation in that gene. Oh, okay. Um, so it's just a point uh, or a, a frame shift. It, so it just mm -hmm. messes up the gene. It won't make a functional protein. Gotcha. Um, so this lab just used CRISPR, you know, a genetic modification right. technique, to induce that same mutation in a POF plus strain. Yeah. So the, li the literal only change in that entire organism is the same frame shift that we already have in right. loads of brewing strains. That mutation happened naturally in those old school right. strains, but here you're just now we have introducing it yourself. Target it. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, so how could one have qualms about using that strain? Right, right. right? I mean, like, what's your hang-up on that? You yeah, know? I feel like brewer... Brewers are interested in science, know more about science, maybe than the general public. Maybe I'm just tooting the horn of myself and no, people I, I know, but I think that's the, no, the I, case. I, I, yeah, I do think that. You know, there's so much misinformation about yeah. this stuff out there that maybe a lot of people in the in the brewing industry are just sort of what, like more informed about it. Although yeah. at the same time, I'm, I you know, there is there feels like there's this difference between manipulating like a single cell organism versus you know an actual cow or something. Yeah, I and. Don't know. Yeah, and there are, I mean, there are certainly things we have to be careful of. I mean, the corn is a good example, right? Oh, I yeah. mean, when you can have pollen that drifts over into your neighbor's field and pollinates right. there. Now, they, they didn't want to do that, but right. they, you know. But now Monsanto's yeah, coming after yeah, you. Yeah, and, and quite literally, like yeah. Monsanto literally, will sue you. Literally coming after Even if you, hey, there's nothing you can do about it. This pollen yeah. floated over into your land and it's pollinated that, your corn. That and, stuff is bonkers. That's like its own yeah. weird but, situation. And all, but all that stuff has contributed to the public's thoughts on these sorts yeah, of things. Yeah. So I think it's kind of set things Well, back. actually, you know, bringing that up does make me think, well, 
if labs are going to start putting out strains that they have patented, you know, but everyone can easily like mm-hmm. get it out of the bottom of a bottle. Yeah. Well, you have to wonder if it's worth investing in, in those. Yeah. Um, I guess pros are still going to have to buy big batches. Yeah. You know, Chico is uh, widely available, but people still buy it all the time. Sure. Right? I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, we provide a, a service in giving you a yeah. fresh, yeah. healthy culture. Right. So if you can do that yourself, right. then do it. Yeah. Your time is spent doing other things. That, sure. you know, so that it's just nice to have the reliable source to go back and get the, the clean stuff. So, I mean, we, we actually did file a patent application on our second hybrid. Kind of the, the way we view that side of it is we're not going to... Brewers share yeast. We're not going to do anything to stop that sort of thing. We, we know the culture. Really, our thought is we there are, there are only certain players we don't want to get that strain and sell it to people. Right, right. Uh, you know, our, Fair enough, our, yeah. our competition. Kind of obvious, yeah. Yes, but uh, brewers can use it. They can sure. grow it up in the brewery, use it however they and want. You know they and, will. Uh, yeah. That's just how it, so the, it's, game, the um, game goes. It'll be interesting to see what some of these newer players, because we've seen some of the licensing agreements from some of these other mm. people, and they, like, on the terms of their license, are essentially prohibiting breweries? They're prohibiting activities that yeah. brewers normally just undertake. Do all the time. Yes. So yeah, that's, good luck with that. Uh, that's good luck enforcing yeah. that. There will be some lawsuit that'll, you know, everyone will be talking about what a scandal it is yeah. when that breaks. But the patent gives them that right. But, yeah. But yeah. there are also, you know, business and kind of cultural norms sure. out there that. Well, and who's going to gonna start? Yeah. Who's going to keep doing business with you after you just sued one of your clients for, yeah. for doing what's a uh, normal practice? Yeah. Very interesting to see where that stuff shakes out. Yeah. Well, Lance, Dr. Lance Shaner, it has been a great pleasure to chat with you. In the not-too-distant future, I will see you at Old Devil Moon, and we will chat again with the addition of Damian Fagan from Almanac Beer Company, and we will drink some Fike fermented ales and ciders, many of which were made with your Voss and Hornendahl and Hothead yeast strains. Very much looking forward to yeah. it. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks. Thanks for coming by. Thank you.